I think we are ready now. Buenos dias, good morning everyone. On behalf of the US Mexico Chamber of Commerce, I would like to welcome all of you. My name is Clementina Gay and I'm the Executive Director of the chapter based here in Miami. Our topic today is how to restart, restart your business, potential employment issues after a prolonged government stay at home order. We are honored to have a group of lawyers from Squire Patton Box, member of the chamber and experts in labor law. Let me introduce our panel. Jill Kirilla. Jill serves as co-leader of the Squire Patton Box Global Labor and Employment Practice. Her clients are in different industries, including technology, retail, manufacturing, healthcare, and financial services. She has been representing employers for more than 20 years. A regular part of Jill's practice includes advising non-US-based companies on establishing or expanding a presence in the US and ensuring the appropriate employment infrastructure and protection. She's a member of the New York, Florida, Texas, and Ohio bars. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. Um, Laura Lawless. Laura is a trial lawyer who represents employers before federal and state courts and administrative agencies, as well as in arbitration and mediation proceedings, defending employers in matters such as discrimination, harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination, breach of contract, breach of contract, as well as in non-competition, non-solicitation, non-disclosure, trade secret, and unfair competition cases. Laura also counsels and collaborates with human resources professionals, including assisting in workplace investigations. Laura is a member of the Arizona Bar. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. And um, Jose, my friend Jose Martin. Jose will be our moderator this morning. Um, Jose worked for more than 13 years in an in-house compliance and corporate counsel as, as an in-house compliance and corporate counselor for major international corporations to advise clients in anti-corruption compliance program, um, compliance program design and implementation, internal investigations and training. Jose also advises clients on labor and employment laws with an emphasis in Mexico and Latin America. Um, he's a member of the Florida, New York, and Mexico bars. Uh, you can see the whole bio in our events website, um, but I, I, I just want to um, have the time for them to, to, um, to uh, talk about our topic. So uh, before I pass the microphone to Jose, just uh, let me mention that if you have questions, please send it to me uh, through the chat. We will try to cover as many questions as we can at the end of uh, their presentation. So, Jose, welcome. Um, thanks, thanks, Clementina. And uh, thanks the US-Mexico Chamber, Inter-American Chamber chapter for um, having us and hosting us. I'm glad to be here. And I can't see the, the people that are online, but I'm sure there's, uh, you can see us. Um, um, we're glad to be hosting this panel on reopening the U.S. business after COVID-19. And of course, we say after COVID-19, when in reality, we're still kind of in the middle of COVID-19, but we're reopening anyway and, and uh, reopening the, the economy, and, or at least parts of it. And uh, I think it's, it's relevant to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, employment and employment issues that come after that. Before, I, I do want to give a little introduction on Squire Patton Boggs. We're a full service law firm with um, offices in more than 20 countries. And of course, we joined the US-Mexico Chamber because we have significant experience and uh, businesses in, in Mexico and of course in the US. So, and of course, because our labor practice is one of the best in, in the world. Um, Laura and Jill have been introduced. Of course, I, didn't, I did want to say that Laura has been named the best lawyer in America since 2014. And Jill has been named best lawyer in America since 2012. So you are really you know, speaking with the best of the best. Um, so back to our topic, um, I thought it may make sense to, to talk a little bit about, uh, give a summary of the pandemic and where, where it began. Uh, it began like 500 years ago in December of uh, 2019. And that's when uh, China notified the World Health Organization that they had discovered a new virus. Um, that was a, uh, an odd pneumonia 
in, in Wuhan, and that was uh, December 31st. Um, uh, January 7th, uh, the virus uh, COVID-19 was identified. January 20th, um, first, first cases outside of China. Uh, that was the time with the first case in the US. January 30th, the World Health Organization declares it a global emergency. March 1st, and we're now in March. March 1st was the first case in New York City. Second, uh, Dr. Fauci, which we all know and um, saw on Saturday Night Live, decided um, that uh, it was probably going to be a pandemic. March 4th in Miami, Ultra Music Festival was canceled for the year. March 5th, um, California was, reports a state of emergency. Um, March 7th, New York declares a uh, state of emergency. Of course, I'm skipping all the deaths and, and infections because that's just not part of what we want to talk about. But it's, it's you know, as you, you know all the, all the statistics. Um, March 11th, the NBA suspends its, uh, the season. March 14th, the White House declares it a national emergency. Uh, by March 15th, 16th, 17th, uh, most school districts in the U.S. are closed. Miami Day closes March 17th. Uh, March 19th, California issues the stay-at-home order. Um, March 24th, and was only in March, uh, the Olympics were postponed. Uh, 26th, the unemployment rate was um, four times the record set in 2008. Um, March 27th, uh, the, the U.S. passes the stimulus package uh, for two, with $2 trillion. March 31st, one-third of the global population is in some form of lockdown. Um, by April 7th, 95% of the U.S. population is in some form of lockdown. And then April 20th, uh, some states begin to reopen, and that's uh, Georgia and South Carolina begin to reopen. Um, by May 11th, lockdowns across the, the, the world begin to ease. And, um, and then we're, um, we're in May 21st and May 20, 24th, uh, where, where some states begin to reopen. Um, just to, for those of you in, in Miami, Miami is uh, slated to pretty much be back to somewhat normal by June 1st when the beaches begin to open. Um, unemployment rate in April was at 14.7%, the highest it's been since the Great Depression. Um, and just so you remember, 100 years ago in February of 2020, uh, the unemployment rate was 3.5, which was the lowest in 50 years. So it's, it's really, you know, something to think about. Another little statistic from Miami, from February 17th to April 12th, there were no homicides reported in the city of Miami. And that's the first time in forever. Uh, so that's a good thing coming out of all of this. Um, so a little brief note on our agenda. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, first we're going to do a, a brief overview of the labor employment concept of COVID-19. Uh, we're going to talk about the work, 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 workplace environment, uh, telework and scheduling, unemployment, furloughs, and leaves of absence, and uh, some helpful resources at the end. If we have, of course, we can also talk about compensation, contract issues, unions, but we won't put any, any we won't talk about that, but if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask. Of course, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. Um, so Jill, uh, first question is, how much should we think about COVID-19 from a labor and employment perspective? Um, is it different or similar to, to other workplace um, health and safety issues we've seen in the past? Yeah, that, that's a great question to start off with because I, I think um, it's definitely different um, in most ways than anything we've ever seen before on the health and safety front of the employment workforce. And um, never in my career have I been, have we been faced with so many changes so quickly affecting the workplace as we tried to get ready uh, for what was coming on the COVID, got ready for the shutdowns, and then tried to respond to the legislation that was passed so quickly. You, you mentioned it started in March um, and all of these new laws came down, laws and through the stimulus packages, laws through Federal Paid Sick Leave Act. And at the backdrop, uh, what has come through loud and clear is that the health and safety aspects of this um, have become paramount among and above everything else. Because if you think about labor and employment laws before this, 
there's always been sort of a general duty to keep your workplace safe um, under OSHA. But with that, and employers have always had to be mindful of other employment laws at the same time, when they're trying to provide a safe and healthy workplace, they needed to be mindful and, and still to some degree to the individual employee rights from a discrimination standpoint, from a privacy standpoint. And, and what we've seen now with COVID, unlike any other time in my history at least, is definitely the movement toward uh, the benefit of the greater good of, of health and safety over the rights of the individual employees. So from my perspective, that's what makes this way different uh, than anything else. And I'm sure we'll get into some of those details, but they've allowed for more, um, you know, testing on behalf of uh, or by employers that before you had to be a, a, a lot more cautious with doing. So things like that. Um, and the only other thing I would mention, you know, how we approach it is, it's not just what's happening at the federal level with all these changes. Um, but in the last five years or so, we've seen increase in state and local law passages with respect to employment issues, and that hasn't changed for COVID. So in, in talking about how do you approach it as an employer, remember, you've got to start with the federal and what's going on at that level. But there's all these jurisdictional levels that have their own rules, both on the shutdown and the reopening orders, health and safety, paid sick leave, that employers, um, unfortunately, are, are, are now facing this, this patchwork of laws with COVID, too, that they need to be mindful of in, in adopting their plans to respond to it. Okay. And Laura, following up with that, um, and I know we weren't prepared, prepared for the pandemic, but do we, do we have adequate laws, regulations? Were we in a, in a, in a place that could address the issues that, that, that Jill was, was talking about? And uh, what did we have and, and what were we missing? What are we missing uh, in that sense? Yeah, a lot of the last couple of months have been trying to catch up and respond to developments as the coronavirus spread. So we had a federal framework for an unpaid time off program under the Family and Medical Leave Act, but not every employer in the country was covered. And even if you were covered, unpaid leave doesn't really um, provide adequate protection for many families. And state and local laws, like Jill mentioned, that provide some measure of paid sick leave, they're a patchwork. They're very inconsistent in what they provide, and employers in different parts of the country are subject to different requirements. And so that was one frustrating part when we were trying to adapt, is how to give advice that serves the best interests, especially of multi-jurisdictional employers who had to comply with so many different levels, and balancing that against the very practical needs of people who live paycheck to paycheck. And as a result, with, with the absence of uh, comprehensive paid sick leave, were initially coming into work for longer periods of time, even if they were showing some signs and symptoms of the illness. And so trying to balance those practical needs with the public health greater good that Jill mentioned, we were uh, struggling until we had some federal guidance on that about what we could do on a more consistent level to try to protect the workplace and meet the needs of um, those who are dependent on their income. So going to the work, workplace environment issues we, you talked about, um, so generally what steps are businesses and what steps should businesses take um, to address some of this safety and, and health issues, the new ones coming up now with, uh, with the virus? Sure, sure. And I think it can be extremely overwhelming for an employer to know what they should be doing, what they have to be doing. And I've had a lot of clients call and just sort of throw their hands up because as we all know, things are changing almost daily with even what we're learning about the virus. And that in fact, in, in turn, impacts kind of what the guidance and, and requirements have been. Um, and so it, it's very overwhelming. And so what we are telling our clients is you, you've got to step back and start with a work, a COVID workplace um, response and preparation plan. Um, and, and this is needed for, for multiple reasons, but mostly it's going to um, 
really address the health and safety issues in the workplace, um, not only as people return to the office or their workplaces, but as we, and as you mentioned, this is not going to go away in, in a couple months, as we live with COVID and manage our workforces accordingly, that that plan is going to be the place that employers can turn to, to regulate, lay out a plan. But also, if, um, you know, if there's an OSHA or liability issues with respect to the spread of COVID in the workplace, the first thing that OSHA or uh, let's say, for example, there's a, a lawsuit relating to the steps that an employer has taken to try to prevent the spread of COVID. The first thing you're going to want to be able to show is that you had your plan in place and it's a written plan. Um, and, and we've been helping clients with a lot of those because they have to be tailored to the individual uh, work site based on industry, based on location. And as I, we keep talking about these levels of jurisdiction, you've got to also start with what OSHA, CDC is saying, but then pull your, you know, right now it's, it's, it's sort of the modified shelter in place orders or the reopening orders of the different localities. And for example, Florida has a very specific one and plan in place on what employers have to do as they're reopening. This is on top of the OSHA requirements. So all of this, um, I think that the way to make it um, most workable is to get that into written plan where you do an assessment of the risks. You make sure it's compliant with on the federal, your state level. And even for example, um, Miami-Dade County, for example, has its own requirements. Um, so all of that, if I were an employer in multi-jurisdictions or even one, there could be three layers that attach. Um, so that's what we've been recommending. And it's a plan that will address, you know, the workplace environment, what modifications you need to do after assessing the risk, what steps do you take to eliminate the risk, and that largely deals with employee screening. Um, and that's going to be based on what kind of level of hazard the work is for that for that employee. And then it also will uh, include what you're going to do for your engineering controls. And those have to deal, deal with physical modifications to your workplace. Um, what physical barriers do you need to put up? Um, everyone's seen the six, the six foot markers um, in lots of retail or, or other establishment. Do you need to do that in your workplace? Um, and, and then the plan will also address things like your administrative controls. And that has to deal with your cleaning of your workplace, sanitizing, um, those type of things. And then finally, the PPE. And a lot of that PPE on the, on the protective uh, wear that you need to, to supply to employees is gonna be addressed in those local orders as well as OSHA. So that's another important part of the, of the plan. Do this, these um, requirements go to the type of cleaning product you need to take, and, and is that is that does that go to that detail, or is this something that the companies can kind of figure it out, or is this like that level of 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 of, of detail in, in some of these plans? Sure. I mean, in, in our plan, it does have that type of level, but there's room for flexibility as long as it's in compliance with those orders. So uh, you can use, employers can use their regular cleaners as long as they're properly trained on what the recommended um, CDC practices are for sanitation and cleaning during COVID. And, and, and so a risk assessment is basically the first thing everyone needs to do, right? Before they Absolutely. reopen, you need to see where their where their risks are. Absolutely. And that might be a walkthrough, right? It, it's a, you know, how do I, if I'm going into wherever that is, if it's a job site location in the office, it's a walkthrough to see where are the hazards. And, and there's a lot of material online too, you know, at the CDC with recommendations, et cetera, in these local reopening orders that give a good idea. Um, but that's absolutely where you start. And then the second step is how are you going to, going to address those to do those goals that I mentioned. Right. right. And then you have a checklist and you go through the workplace and go, go click checking the ones that you have or the ones you don't have. Absolutely that. And then also how are you going to implement it, right? Because it's is, is all we all know it's nice to have something in writing but if it gets thrown into a cabinet 
um, it's not going to be effective, you know, as a liability mitigator or which is its ultimate goal to, to try to help stop the spread of COVID so we can try to get on to as much as normal as possible. And, and Laura, how far do employees need to need to go? And, and I'm talking about PPEs or, or personal protective equipment or mat, how, how much cleaning, how much equipment, how much barriers, how much, you know, what's, what's, what's good enough or is this not a good enough situation? Well, some of it's going to be driven by your local orders. So obviously you need to go as far as the minimum requirements that are set. But the CDC has also provided some helpful industry directed guidance that assesses levels of risk and recommendations for PPE based on particular um, industries. So if you're working in close proximity with individuals um, where you're actually within the six foot range that prevents social distancing in a healthcare setting, for example, um, the CDC has recommendations for the types of PPE that are recommended, like gowns, face masks, gloves, um, face shields, and that's the employer's responsibility because you can't provide an adequately safe working environment as is your responsibility in this time without providing that equipment. There are other less, um, less intense working relationships or dynamics where you don't have to be within the six foot rule and there are other administrative and engineering controls that can help minimize the spread, such as physically distancing workstations or installing plexiglass to help minimize droplet spread, or even just shifting the number of people on at any particular time, spreading out the workday and having staggered work shifts so that you can keep the numbers in the workplace down. So it's a combination of looking at what your local requirements are and then recommendations and best practices for the industry um, and tailoring it to your particular workforce. And part of that assessment that Phil mentioned of going through the workplace and seeing where there are concentrated work centers, are there ways that you can reconfigure the workplace that help to create um, you know, a healthier environment, a safer work environment as people are coming back in? Okay, and, and just for, for those listening, we'll talk about the potential liability for employers, but we'll talk about that later. So if you're, you know, you just kind of kind of stick it out and wait because that's a the big part of this. So so what about what about uh, can you take um, employees' temperature? Can you ask them questions about their travel, their family, their health history? Can you do all these? Uh, you know, do more than just you know um, just you know give them a face mask if that's can you ask them questions, test them, take blood? How, how far can we go? We do have some additional leeway for, temp for screening employees and for assessing if they are currently symptomatic or um, at risk of spreading. And this was an adjustment for all of us because as you mentioned in your opening remark, we come from a place of always being very protective of employee privacy. And then as part of our goal towards creating a, a safer work environment, some of that had to be compromised in some ways. We now feel a bit more reassured because the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that, that is um, charged with investigating and remedying discrimination on a number of fronts, including disability-related dis discrimination, has given us some guidance that says you can take temperatures of workers uh, and you can ask if they are currently symptomatic. Uh, if they've traveled recently, some of those basic questions that create a higher risk situation. Uh, and you can ask employees who are symptomatic not to come into the workplace. Uh, we have to be a little bit cautious about how far we go because there's also some recommendations not to go too deep into um, family contact testing type questions like where has your family gone? What are their family risks? Because there's the Genetic Information on discrimination Act um, and, and that protects against um, making decisions based on genetic predispositions or um, you know, physical risks that are incumbent through family connections. But certainly to an employee who's entering the workplace and can be bringing current virus in with them and creating a risk to themselves and others, the EEOC gives us the green light at this point to do some symptom screening and temperature testing. Okay, and, and and what about what about visitors? Can you well? I guess the EEOC doesn't apply to to them, maybe. But what can I ask, and what can I do? Well, you're right. The EEOC is going to be governing the employment relationship. But as a business owner, if you are implementing uh, symptom screening, many businesses are. Um, many physical property owners, renters, lessors are creating uh, checklists or screening 
um, screening checklist to see if people entering the, the building are symptomatic. The one thing I would caution is that if you're a private business owner and you have customers coming in, um, they are subject to protection under Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act that governs public accommodations. And so you do still have to comply with requirements to make exceptions for those with disabilities. So for example, there was a lawsuit filed yesterday by, against a retailer who would not allow shoppers to come into a retail store if they weren't wearing a face mask without exception, even though the local orders in that jurisdiction said that there would be an exception for those with medical conditions. So tread a little bit lightly in having black and white rules that exclude visitors from public accommodations without any exceptions, because some may have medical conditions that prohibit the use of respiratory face masks. What about, what about those who don't, those who just don't want to wear a face mask, employer or, or, or customer? Well, let's talk about employees first, or employees specifically. What if they don't want to get tested? They don't want to wear a face mask. They, they don't want to, you know, not congregate. You know, they want to go back to the way things were, let's say. What, what can you do? What can you do there? Well, I can think the reason for the rejection of the testing or the compliance with face masks is, is important to understand. If it is simply a refusal because the person thinks that it's an invasion of their privacy or they just think that this is an overblown concern and we're making too much out of it, you have the right to refuse to have employees con continue to work if they're refusing to comply with regulations that are applicable to all others. If it's a medical-based complaint and there's an, a request for an accommodation from a workplace rule because, for example, they have um, you know, a serious health condition that prohibits the use of a mask, or they have a disability where wearing a mask makes it harder for them to communicate, then we need to still engage in an interactive dialogue to see if there's alternatives before having a categorical refusal to allow them to work or disciplinary action. Okay, and, and this, this, is, this is just to, to close this, 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 this set of questions and, and idea, but all of these have to be written down, all of these policies. Do you need, do you need, I'm assuming in order to make an employee wear a face mask, you need to have it in a handbook or do you need a new handbook? Do you need to create these requirements in writing and, and publicize them to employees before they can, they can, or do you just use the, your, your current handbook and, and say, well, this is, what are, what are, what are we recommending for, for employers? A lot of it depends on the size of the employer. So it's very hard, to, especially in a very large business or a multi-jurisdictional business, to roll out a new handbook overnight. But to have short-term policy addenda to deal with the current situation that's communicated in the way that you would otherwise communicate the handbook through email or uh, notice posting in the workplace, as long as it's communicated to employees in advance and they have an understanding that that's the employer's expectation, and that should satisfy your requirements. But it is good to keep it written down. And if you can get written acknowledgements or signed acknowledgements that that's a new term and condition of employment, that helps as well if people stop complying with those rules down the road. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Jill, so moving, moving to um, tele, telework and, and uh, what, is, what is it? And is it different? I mean, I remember before this started, I was working from home once in a while. Is that, is that telework or, or legally is, is it, are we talking about a different animal and, and should we have different rules? What, are, what, is, what, are, what, do, what do we mean when we say telework or working from home and what, what's, what's that? Sure, um, I'll take that one. I, 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 there's no, to understand from the outset, there's no legal definition of telework or work from home or remote working. The, the concepts are all the same, but, but generally when we hear telework, it's on a, a permanent or indefinite basis where someone is working away from the regular work site and using modern technology to stay in contact with customers colleagues, um, et cetera. And so it, it's more on an ongoing basis than the occasional work from home situation, but certainly work from home on a regular basis is a form of teleworking. Um, but there's no um, legal definition associated with, with either of those. But the idea is certainly, um, as we've all seen in COVID, and I think we've all realized more, more and more populate, employee populations are able to work from home. Um, and so either if it's on a temporary basis until we get a vaccine and things, you know, are, are able to be safely returned to a set workplace, or as I think will more likely be the case, we adjust to having a bigger part of our workforce who's a regular um, tele working 
population, there are changes that come with that and other risks as well that employers certainly need to be mindful of as, as we deal with, with more of, of our uh, employees working from home or at cafes, anywhere but at their regular work site. What, what kind of changes uh, are you talking about? Do we need changes to the employment agreements? What, what, would, what would be the changes that, that, that you, you foresee? Sure. So, so um, that's the first place that I always say, if you've got employees with employment agreements and you're going to make changes to their terms and conditions, you need to make sure that it's not a change to something that's in their written employment agreement because that's a contractual obligation. Um, short of having a contract with an employee, a written employment contract, if they're at will employees, and maybe they have an offer letter though that has specific um, terms about their, you know, if you work here, here's how it will go. You you may need to, in, in, in any event, it's, it's highly recommended that if someone is going to change on a permanent basis, that you get a new, um, either whether it's a, you know, modified offer letter or something in writing agreement um, that is going to indicate what those new terms and conditions are of the work because things that change are really, um, you think about it, uh, everything, right? So you're, if you've got non-exempt, um, and for those who may not know, non-exempt refers to folks who are entitled to overtime payment uh, for hours over 40 and in a few states uh, could be daily overtime. If you work more than 40, it's going to be harder to capture the work time of those folks if they're working remote and not in a fixed location. So when you ask about what, what do we need to do to change it, it is recommended that you have, and one of the things we've been doing a lot of, is a new, um, if you're dealing with an at-work uh, or an at-will workforce, is a new teleworking type uh, policy and agreement that employees sign off on that sets forth what the changes and expectations are going to be because you now have to think about, okay, um, I really didn't have this many people working from home. What do I as the employer need to pay for if they're going to be having a computer, a printer, a phone? Um, what falls on me and what falls on the employee? Um, and those things need to be ironed out in the agreement, but some of those can be dictated by law based on the state that your employee is working in. So again, we're seeing that theme of the jurisdictional layers to be mindful of, because if you're in a state that has a requirement that you reimburse for reasonable business expenses, those can apply to things like how much uh, internet costs. To, to get the connection from home. Places like California, that's a huge concern um, and something that's required. And so you've got to figure out if I am going to allow this work from home, what are the parameters, what costs are going to result to the company, and also what protections that you need to ensure in place because you're, you're now, you know, moving from having your technology in, in one location where it's spread all over the place. And so absolutely critical to understand that you've got the necessary uh, infrastructure in place to protect your confidential information, your, your personal data that you may have on your systems, which now your employees working remote are going to have more access to and they're, therefore more opportunity for it to be disseminated. What about, um, and I don't know, this might be a, a difficult question to answer now, but what about accidents and is, is with an accident at home if I'm working from home would that be uh, how is that how is that being defined that's a very very good question so that's going to depend on the state law uh, and their workers compensation laws and case law that um, but for the most part if they if their new work site is home-based work site and they're injured they absolutely could have a claim under workers' compensation because it's arising at work or at, from work at the workplace. However, that's also, as you can imagine, very difficult. You know, did, did someone fall in their home office or did they fall when they were, you know, grabbing a kid from, from the other room? Um, those are all challenges now that need to be thought through and mitigated. And there's certainly, you know, I mentioned that telework uh, agreement 
and that can also address what are some if it's going to be a fixed location in the home you could even consider coming out to do an inspection of that um, to make sure they are working in a safe environment that might be going a little bit overboard but you can definitely put some requirements in your in your agreement so that they're aware um, of, of some safety precautions to take while they're in their home workspace. Right. And, and, and employees see, can employers simply deny a request and an employee doesn't want to go back to the office for whatever reason, you know, probably um, daycare issues or just doesn't want to go back because they're scared or, or can you say, no, I'm sorry, you, you know, you've got to come back. That, that is probably the hottest question of the last two weeks <laughs> that, that I've gotten. Um, and it, it's more complicated than it, than it sounds because like Laura said about the other question, you have to look at the reason that's provided for not wanting to come back. So in, in work from home instead, because they've been working from home. And is the issue, again, that I just don't, I'm afraid I'm going to get it. I, I don't want to come back into the workplace. I don't, do I have a right to keep working from home? The answer is no, if that's the only reason, you know, that's provided. However, if the reason is a legally protected reason, then you've got to analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, um, for those employers out there who are under 500 employees, you, as you know, are covered by um, the Family First Corona's, FICRA, as I call it, paid sick leave law, which also has an element of extended FMLA leave that covers the need for child care. Jose, you mentioned, what if it's, I don't have anybody to watch, uh, they're closed still because of COVID. Um, and, you know, is that the reason? But if they're needed, that reason goes to, I need to be able to watch my child at home. So they don't have a right to telework and watch their child um, at the same time under the paid sick leave laws, but they would have a right to certain paid leave potentially for that purpose um, if that was one of the covered reasons. And the other big one I want to mention, because this is the one that's been popping up, um, I have an underlying condition that makes me uh, part of the highly vulnerable population as defined by the CDC. And um, I'm concerned that I have a high risk of getting very, very sick if I get COVID from the workplace. In that situation, if the employee asks for an accommodation because of that underlying uh, disability or condition, what most employers um, find themselves having to, to strongly consider is if they've been able to work from home before um, and they have a doctor's certification that that's a risk to them if they come back into the workplace given the underlying condition, um, for the most part the employer's likely going to have to to accommodate that if they're able to work from home. That's probably going to be considered a reasonable accommodation um, that they need to provide. Not in all cases, but um, that's something to definitely be mindful of. Um, I saw a communication the other day that said, everybody back to work June 8th, no exceptions. Um, <laughs> and that's the kind of thing you, you just can't do. And it, it's unfortunately a little more complicated and has to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Laura, this might be a concept that has gone away, but work-life balance, when you're working from home, is that, does that, does that exist anymore? Is that a, like, I, that was a weird policy maybe anyway, but is this something that uh, the companies should, should consider or re reframe or redefine as, a, as people begin to maybe work from home a little more? It's an important concept because two reasons. One, you don't want your work force to be completely burned out. We know it's very hard to segment working day from home day if you're doing it in the same environment because it all becomes one big mess. You know, you're doing the laundry and you're feeding the kids at the same time you're taking conference calls. So it's helpful to try to define a time frame within which employees should be dedicating most of their attention to work. And that's a reasonable expectation, especially on an extended basis, an extended working from home arrangement. 
because you're entitled to full productivity during those working hours that you're paying for. The other reason why it's important is um, for purposes of compensation, especially with your non-exempt workers who you're paying for the time that they're working and you're tracking that carefully and making sure that they're paid overtime weekly and daily in states that require it, you need to know when the workday begins and ends. And so it's important to encourage that employees have a defined space in the house that becomes their home office. And if it's not a separate office, a dedicated workspace, that helps also on the workers' compensation front to define where the workspace is. And that their workday begins and ends at specific times and provide metrics, um, reasonable benchmarks, regular communication. If you're used to doing morning stand-up meetings, have a phone call. If you're used to doing weekly check-ins and one-on-ones with managers and staff, continue that practice so that you know that everyone's working towards a common goal and that they're not spending uh, insufficient time and they're not getting burned out either. And we talked about new handbooks and possibly new, new employment arrangements. Um, is there any other communication that employers should, should make and, and, or, or send to employees as they reopen? Any, anything else that you've seen companies do uh, to inform employees of the new rules to anything else that you think is, is necessary? They, they, they already did the risk assessment. They moved everything around. They gave everyone face masks. Anything else they need to, um, they need to, tell employees or communicate to them before they come back to work? The protocols that you're implementing as an employer are incredibly important to share with your staff. Um, you know, Jill's point is, is completely correct. If people are just refusing to come back because they have an irrational fear of the workplace, you don't need to accommodate that, but it's a realistic concern. I mean, this is a very scary disease with very serious consequences. And so I'm reluctant to dismiss out of hand the concerns employees have returning to the workforce. You can give them a, a great sense of um, comfort that you've taken reasonable steps by sharing with them what your sanitation plan is, what your engineering and administrative controls are, what you've done to source PPE, what your expectations are as you restore people to the workplace. Is it going to be 100% of your workforce coming in at the same time, or is it going to be more staggered and gradual? Um, you know, those sorts of reassurances do help to quell the natural anxieties that many of us, myself included, share as you're returning to the workforce. And speaking of returning to the workplace, um, those employ employers who furlough them employees, um, what should they, if you're bringing them back, whether, you know, after, you know, do, uh, after the time they said or, or in the term they said or uh, what should they be considering? What are the what are the things uh, em employers who furloughed employees need to think about before bringing employees back? There's a few things to consider. Um, first is, are you going to bring everybody back, or is it going to be just a percentage of those who have been furloughed? And if it's not going to be everyone, how do you make the selection criteria apply for who you're bringing back to make sure that you're doing it in a way that meets your business needs? Um, that's not arbitrary, that's not discriminatory in its selection and communicating that and communicating the, the alternatives to those who are not being returned, making sure that the termination processes go smoothly. And for those who have been furloughed and who have um, not been paying out, obviously not been getting paid and therefore not paying their own share of premiums for benefits, communicating how you're going to recoup that, if at all, or if the employer is just going to absorb the cost that they've covered during that period of furlough. Um, communicating if there's going to be any reasonable accommodations that are necessary now, um, because some may have different um, health or disability concerns than before they went out. Um, so having as much planned in advance that you don't have a crush on that first day when, when returned. Okay, and we'll talk about maybe litigation a little later, but um, is this some, like, so employ, em, employers can't just decide to, to pick the younger, the ones that might not be at higher risk. They might decide, oh, well, I'll just bring back the healthier employees. And, and is that, there are a lot of things that they need to decide, but they can't decide based on, I guess, um, improper reasons, right? There's a reasoning requirement that they need to, need to think about. That's right. And it may seem like you're making a very wise decision by selecting those who are younger or those who appear to be in better health or those, you know, who aren't pregnant right now and thinking, well, they're at the lowest risk of returning them. So I'm being benevolent in doing so. But the reverse is true. You're having an adverse impact and an adverse consequence for those who are potentially disabled or older. And, and that's, um, that's absolutely not permissible and would get you into a great deal of hot water from a discrimination standpoint. So 
if you're making a return to work, maybe it's those whose jobs can only be performed within the workplace and others are staying home for the time being. Um, or those whose jobs are more critical and we've decided to downsize and eliminate other projects. That's a legitimate non-discriminatory operations driven reason as opposed to trying to base it on a protected characteristic or membership in a protected class. And, and I'm, I'm sure they need companies to document how their decision making process, right? Very much so. Okay. Think about it logically, go into it with a clear plan of what you're trying to accomplish and document the reasons for the selection. And, and, and Jill, if, if the company isn't thinking about bringing everyone or, or just some people or, or not bringing um, anyone back uh, from furlough and, and they decide they need to do anything in, in, or can just the furlough just continue indefinitely and you, know, you never call them and you kind of ghost your employees and they don't, they they don't call away. you, don't call them and you know, kind of forget about it. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you absolutely. Um, it's another employment event, uh, right? Because they're going to be terminated. And a lot of times folks who are still on furloughs might be getting still healthcare benefits, etc. And so if you are going to convert those out on furlough to termination status or, or layoff, um, yeah, the first thing to think about too, uh, for those who with larger organizations is the WARN Act. Um, because the WARN Act essentially requires, it's a federal act that requires 60 days advance notice um, if 50 full-time employees, and there are some other requirements, but if 50 full-time employees are going to experience a, quote, employment loss at a, a particular employment site, um, it's a very, very technical law. But in essence, if an employment loss can be folks that have been furloughed or out, laid off for six months or more. So you, even if you're not going to terminate them, you need to be mindful of the numbers who are out on furlough and for how long, because you can trigger WARN inadvertently. Um, if you bring them back and they're going to work before that six month layoff status, then um, in another caveat, always a caveat for there are some states that have their own mini WARN closing acts. And so, um, you need to be mindful of those two, whether it's an extended layoff or termination, because an outright termination event, if there are more than the 50 employees full time who are going to be impacted in, in a site of employment, you're going to have additional requirements and it's going to be very difficult because they've been out on furlough already and you're supposed to give them 60 days notice which traditionally is supposed to be with pay and benefits. And so it can get very sticky, but there are significant penalties and damages if you don't comply with that. For those who aren't in that ballpark and, and hopefully don't have that many layoffs uh, that will be or terminations that will be coming, you do also need to be mindful of the state separation notice rules in the state that you're in. A lot of states have rules on when you are terminating someone that you need to provide them with specific separation notice. And usually that refers to notice about their unemployment rights, where to go, particular notices on that. Um, and, and some states require more information. So that's number one. You've got to make sure you're complying with that. And then also, um, right, even though they've been out on furlough, once you convert them to a terminated status, under most states' laws, that means final pay act, or the, the final pay laws are triggered. So you need to make sure if they have, if they're required to get PTO paid out on termination, um, that that is done at that time as well. Um, and then the other thing, just to, to uh, mirror what uh, Laura mentioned, when you are picking those who will be let go, the same uh, guidance comes in with respect to how you pick those who will be separated, just as you would if it was a normal reduction in force or reorg with selection criteria documented, what's the business reason, and be mindful of the impact on any protected classes so that you'll be able to defend against any claims of discrimination arising from those uh, terminations. We, we, to leave a little bit, bit of time for, for questions, um, I did want to talk about litigation, and, and this is a question for, for, for both of you. 
where do you see the biggest risks for companies? Um, I, I, I like I, I get I get I get sick at, in, in the office. I come back and I get sick. Where, where uh, what, what else? What are the risks that you see, and where do you see uh, the biggest potential liabilities in, in, in litigation in in this area? So uh, I'll start, Laura, with that. Um, right, and everyone in 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 Washington DC right now that the big talk and concern is about um, people who get sick uh, with COVID from work and what's the liability to organizations or their their customers are infected or their you know client whatever the populations that they serve are are infected with COVID. When it comes to employees, we do have, and again, here's another area that's going to vary by state law, but a very strong workers' compensation system that provides immunity to employers um, with respect to illnesses or injuries that arise during the workplace. But the question is then, is this then, if I have all these workers' compensation because I have an outbreak, um, and, and they hit, and it's not necessarily going to be covered by workers' compensation. As of now, it depends on the industry you're in, whether they can specifically show that COVID was contracted from work. For example, you have an outbreak. And so those are some, some examples of where it, it is going to be likely to be covered under workers' comp. But provided it's covered under workers' comp or, or potentially could be, the employer is going to have immunity from lawsuits from its employees for negligence, um, et cetera, with some key exceptions. So, and these are the ones that, um, you know, employers really, I keep going back to this, this preparedness plan. If I were, there's nothing else I would do other than that because of the risks and the unknowns right now, because there are many states that have intentional torts and, these have already started to stir and it's a way around the workers compensation system where an employee could say employer you were reckless um, or you were grossly negligent knowing that you didn't take the steps that you were supposed to take to protect me at work you didn't do all these things that we're, we've been talking about for 40 minutes and you allowed you know I heard one they, they had a corona happy hour last week crazy so it's absolutely imperative that you take this recommended steps to show that you're doing what you can do and, and acting reasonably because there is that risk of an intentional tort that can be brought. Uh, and then finally, remember there's uh, OSHA, for example, that's the governing agency and, and any um, similar state health and safety agencies that can come in, inspect and find you um, if, if in fact you don't have the required uh, protocols in place. So that's the other kind of risk. Um, and then I would say, and Laura, I'll flip it over to you because there's, there's lots of litigation risk on the employment front. The other big one that I'm seeing is, is now, um, and these are trickling in um, and will increase in my opinion, but retaliation type or whistleblower type litigation from employees because there have been uh, examples of employees who are saying, listen, this is not a safe, you're not providing enough PPE, I, I, do, I do not feel safe. Um, and for whatever reason, if something happens to that employee, um, they can then claim it's because of their complaint about COVID related safety issues. So that's another big one that employers need to be mindful of and, and frankly is mitigated by the same protocols we've been talking about throughout the hour. Yeah, I would add to that. I mean, I think that covers the waterfront, especially on the health and safety side, um, but there are still exposure for liability on more traditional employment related cases that are now in the COVID scheme. So just this morning, the EEOC announced that there's been the, the sharpest uptick in charges filed for failure to accommodate. So I think we're gonna see failure to accommodate both on the work from home and adjustment of PPE in the workplace issues, failure to comply with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which has the potential to be set up very easily for a class or collective action, for failure to pay for paid sick leave or for the time off for childcare, 
that's certainly a risk. And a number of employers have also been asking employees to volunteer their time to sew masks or to do extra work from home where they haven't been recording their time correctly, or they've paid shift differentials or retention bonuses to try to encourage them to work during this uncertain time period and not calculating overtime correctly. So I think that we're also going to see, and that can last for quite some time with the three-year statute of limitations on that. So we could be looking at litigation um, for wage-related claims, both under federal law and, and state laws, many of which have very unique paid sick leave statutes for many years to come. And those could be set up easily as class and collective action. So I think, you know, this is just a new wrinkle in some traditional labor and employment law work. Um, and then the risk but on the workers safety side of things is just a very new challenge. We have developed some really great materials. We have a very, very sharp occupational safety and health team as part of our labor and employment group that can help with those protocols. Um, and this is really a time when don't assume that because we've done things a certain way that, we, that it works in this environment. This is definitely a time to consult with outside counsel before making significant changes to your workforce, restructuring or, or dealing with employee requests for accommodation. Right. Uh, Jill, before before we, we, we finish, I, you mentioned at the beginning that there were resources. Do you do you have? Um, and of course, we can provide the, the we can provide Clementina with uh, resources. But are there any resources that come to mind that companies can go to or, or, or seek help, especially on the risk assessment checklist or the walkthrough checklist and, and that sort of thing? Anything that the government has published or other organizations have published, or maybe we have published. Yep, absolutely. Well, uh, first and foremost, we've got a wealth of information on our blog. Um, and, and so anyone who's interested in that can contact us and you will get more information and helpful information um, with respect to managing COVID in the workplace. But also OSHA, you can go on, on their website in the Department of Labor uh, website under OSHA for specific guidance that they put out on the health and safety aspects. Um, the CDC has a wealth of information and recommendations for employers um, that, that should be consulted. And then also you should absolutely go to your, your uh, state. Um, they all have a COVID website um, that deals with the orders that are in place for the state and then even the county and potentially city. Um, and if you just Google that and go to that site, they have a host of resources there that can help with these type of checklists as well. Um, so there's lots out there, but what is not out there is something kind of pulling it all together um, to help employers manage it. Um, and I do think, again, to Laura's point, uh, this is a time to try to use your counsel to, to, you could start with those resources, but pull them all together because they have to be tailored to your, your industry and location, et cetera. Okay. And I think uh, we're about to run out of time. Um, uh, Laura, Jill, do you have any, any quick 20-second um, um, closing? Or, um, and, and thank you uh, both for, for, uh, for this excellent conversation. And uh, any, any, any quick closing remarks? And just thank you to Clementina and to the Chamber for inviting us. We were very happy to participate and happy to help further if any of your members have any questions going forward. Absolutely. I, I echo that. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Laura, Jill, Jose. Um, thank you for uh, support our members um, and to the audience. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation as, as much as we did. And uh, we will keep you informed about our f uh, future webinar. Um, and also you can find information and you are, are going to find this uh, webinar, uh, re recorded webinar at our social media at USMCOCIA. So see you in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest, rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.